right, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16 as we continue our study uh, through the first gospel account in the Bible. Now from Matthew 16 on, Jesus is focused on what lies behind, uh, in front of him in Jerusalem and trying to prepare his disciples for it. It's going to be quite an intense experience once they get to Jerusalem. And it's extremely important that they have a solid belief in who he is and what his, he is about, what his mission has been, and what he is accomplishing once they get there in Jerusalem as he goes to the cross on, on behalf of our need for atonement for sins. And then, of course, he's going to be resurrected, and then eventually they're going to watch the ascension into heaven and, and then understand that the Holy Spirit is coming as that invisible presence of Christ for everyone. Now, when he asked his disciples whom they thought that he was, what did he say? He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And so he had just told them in Jerusalem that he would suffer many things and that he would be killed and then resurrected. He told them that they would be called on to deny themselves as well and take up their own cross and follow him. And then in losing life, though, for his sake, they would actually gain life. And he's not just talking about what, you know, would happen if they lost their physical lives for his sake. But he's also talking about the transformation of their souls. That change, that redemption, that plan that I, I, I like to think of as redemption and lift. When a person confesses Christ as Lord, they are raised up to newness of life. We talked about that, uh, Michael did there at communion. So that's what he's shared with them up to this point. Then he goes on to uh, look down the corridor of time and listen to what he tells them in verse 27. Matthew 16, verse 27. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Now, Jesus speaks here of a time that he will return in glory, and note that his angels will accompany him. And one of the things that this tells us, by the way, is that Jesus is not on equal footing with angels. They are his angels, uh, and they are there to serve him and to be uh, messengers at times. So, you know, they're at his disposal. He's the son of God. These guys are angels. <laughs> and so they're his angels, and they'll come with him, he says. Uh, and, uh, and so beforehand in the parables, if you remember those kingdom parables we looked at earlier in Matthew, uh, we saw the angels as those who are going to gather in the harvest. Okay? And I think uh, when you look at it that way, uh, of what we refer to as the rapture of the church and uh, gathering in of those who have confessed Jesus as Lord. And uh, the word rapture means caught up. Listen to what the Apostle Paul uh, says when he describes this, uh, this future event. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be raptured, will be caught up, and together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So at this time, those who are gathered together with him will be rewarded for their service on earth and how they have served the Lord and ministered to others and walked that walk with him. And this is called the judgment seat of Christ. So there will be a judgment of rewards that will be given. We're not going to be judged for our sins when we stand before the Lord. Uh, that's been taken care of at the cross. Our sins are atoned for already. You know, I used to think when I was a kid that that's what was going to happen when I stood in front of Jesus, that there, I always thought there might be a film that would roll, you know, showing all my sins, you know, throughout my life. And my mother would be shaking her head and weeping, you know, and all these kinds of things. But, uh, but you know, that's not going to happen. We're, this is a judgment of reward. And so that's the uh, coming yet, of course, after the return of the Lord. Now, in verse 28 in Matthew 16, he continues. He said, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, Mark records this just with slight difference here. He, he says, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. It's a present kind of thing. Uh, and we're going to see a little bit of what 
happens when this occurs. Uh, it's clear in this statement, I think, that he's not referring to his second coming here. Uh, but rather, in fact, you know, if you think about it, over 2,000 years have gone by and he hasn't come as yet. And so those who were standing there would not taste death till they saw the kingdom of heaven coming in power, present in power, uh, you know, they were, they've already gone to be with the Lord. Uh, a long time ago. And so this is something that is perhaps going to, going to happen right away. That he's speaking of concerning the, the some who would not taste death until they experience this. I'm sorry, I'm used to turning the pages with my right hand. And uh, uh, allow me a minute or two each time, I guess, when I do that. So, uh, Some have suggested that Jesus was speaking about the ascension into heaven coupled with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit by Jesus on the day of Pentecost. You read about both of those events there in Acts chapters 1 and 2. But when we read the following account here in Matthew 16, we can clearly see of what he was speaking, I think. Note that he said some, not all. And we know that on the day of Pentecost, at the ascension as well, all of these guys were there except for one, of course, and that was Judas Iscariot, who had betrayed Jesus. So this, there's going to be some who would not taste death, and they'll, they'll witness this coming of the kingdom uh, present in him. So note that Peter, James, and John uh, would qualify as some. And here's what happens here uh, in first verse of chapter 6, 17. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. Now tradition seems to indicate that a lot of folk have thought over the years that, that Mount Tabor is, is that mountain, but according to William Barclay, he's, he's got a lot of interesting things, bad things to say. Uh, Mount was occupied by a giant fortress on top of it and seems unlikely that this would be the site of what Jesus would choose for this to happen. And uh, Barclay believes that Mount Hermon, standing nearly 10,000 feet high uh, and uh, only 14 miles from where Jesus had been with his disciples and asked that question, who do you think that I am? Who do you believe that I am? That uh, it would be the, a logical choice that it would be Mount Hermon it was so high you could actually see it 100 miles away at the Dead Sea, from the Dead Sea. Another suggestion is Mount Miron, uh, the highest mountain between Caesarea Philippi where they had been and Capernaum where they were headed, I think. And so the, the higher slopes of those mountains would have been perfect for solitude and prayer as Jesus was seeking to be refreshed in his communion with the Heavenly Father. And uh, so... Uh, that would be a likely reason for going to a high mountain where there's a lot of solitude available. In fact, Luke tells us that Jesus indeed was praying when this transfiguration happened to him, uh, as we're about to see. External pressures have been building up. He's been under great attack from the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the scribes, and and he's uh, experienced a, a lot of uh, uh, you know persecution and harassment. And, you know, he's, he's tired and he needs refreshing. And so that's when Jesus would go into prayer uh, when he needed that. And it's a great example to us as well. That when we are under stress, we're going through something difficult, the best thing in the world we could possibly do, uh, you know, is get alone with the Lord. And spend some time of refreshing with him. Uh, somebody said, uh, if we do not come apart, then we will fall apart. You know, and I think, uh, especially those of you who have followed the Lord for a long time, understand that, that that's something that He will do for us if we, you know, come apart unto Him. In fact, I often marvel at people who have extended illnesses. And they have often told me of how an amazing spiritual experience has come to them during their time uh, in isolation or time more alone. And as they were able to spend some beautiful time of communion with God, uh, when they're not able to work or be about in a lot of activity. In fact, I've had a couple of nights where I couldn't sleep, you know, during this thing. And, and you know, I've had some beautiful communion with the Lord during those times. It's been so refreshing, you know. So it's a, it's, it's a way that God, uh, that Jesus experienced uh, that refreshing in his own soul. Um, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him. Now, no reason is given by Jesus as to why he chose these three men to go with him upon the mountaintop. 
But uh, just a guess would be that they had the greatest, the strongest leadership history among the disciples. Perhaps they followed Jesus most closely as well. Uh, you know, and were hungry to learn from what he was teaching. And Jesus had noted that. And uh, those, he even said in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. And so he saw these guys as being ready to experience what they were going to experience there on that mountain. So he singled out these three men. And he did it actually three times uh, in the New Testament, the Gospels. And all three times the issue of death was involved. Uh, the first was when Jesus took them into the house of Jairus, uh, whose daughter had died. And Jesus, after he had removed all of his detractors from the household, uh, he raised her up from the dead. And then the second was the transfiguration experience in today's text. And where he is again focusing their attention on what is going to happen to him when he gets to Jerusalem. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be crucified. He's going to die and suffer there. And then the third is the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus is preparing to accept his suffering and death as God's will, the will of his Father for him. And so these three men were pulled aside toward him uh, in all three of those occasions. In verse 2, Let's read that. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. So Jesus was transfigured here. Now, this means that his appearance changed. He was shining with the glory of God. And which would in the Old Testament would have been called the Shekinah. The word transfigured here comes from the combination of words that describe what in the English is known as metamorphosis. If you in school studied science and uh, and, and botany and biology and all this, you know you understand about uh, metamorphosis, uh, and it indicates a transformation of something from one form to another, and then that other form is a permanent form. Uh, so metamorphosis is a change from one form to another. We understand that this term is what happens, of course, when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. Uh, and I heard somebody talking about that the other day, how this poor worm, you know, he never dreamed and be possible to be a beautiful butterfly. Then one day he wakes up and there he is flying around, you know, and everybody going, wow, <laughs> look at that beautiful butterfly. Uh, and that's what happens to us, too, as we are awakened to the Lord. Uh, so... Uh, the connotation is that Jesus, eternal divine nature, broke through his human nature. And he always carried that glory. When he was walking around here on the earth, uh, both God and man at the same time, he walked around on this earth. He carried the glory inside of him. But in this particular case, the glory is seen on the outside of him as well. Uh, Ray Stebbin points out that Jesus, in a sense, briefly slipped fully back into his pre-human glory that he had always had in heaven with the Father. Now, in John 17, Jesus pointed that out in his prayer to the Father. In John 17, verse 5, And now, O Father, he prays, glorify me together with yourself. With what glory? Glorify me with what glory? What's he talking about? He said, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And so that's what he's looking forward to there. And, and uh, the term also is used of what happens in a spiritual sense to believers as well. Uh, in Romans chapter 12 verse 2 points this out and when we talked through Romans we talked about this but he wrote about being transformed by the renewing of your mind uh, the word for transformed is the same word that used for transfigured here in Matthew chapter 17 uh, and so there is a transformation that happens in the life of a believer as well where the glory of Christ breaks through uh, into our nature and his nature begins to be seen in us as well. 
Uh, we refer to that as being born again or you know, coming alive in Christ. Uh, Michael talked about how we were once dead in our trespasses and sins and we were made alive in Him. And so that's the, the glory of Christ that comes to us there. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3.18, he said, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being what? Transformed. Uh, metamorphosis into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now aren't you glad that our old fleshly nature is not the permanent state we're in? You know? It's not the way we're always going to be. It's because that metamorphosis that is taking place where the Spirit of Christ is in us to, for His glory to emerge in who we are, our character and how we relate to others. His love fills our hearts. We're able to be people who are able to love and not hate and, and be other-centered instead of self-centered and those kinds of things. And so we're transformed from glory to glory. Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus during the transfiguration talking with him. Now, the word translated appeared is the same that is used to describe the appearance of angels uh, there as Jesus was being resurrected in Luke 24, 34, when he appeared to his followers in his glorified body. Now, note here that Moses and Elijah appear there They've already experienced the glorification. They've already experienced the glory of God with their immortal bodies designed for eternity. And you're going, you and I are going to have one too. You know, we're going to experience that physically someday, but we're experiencing it spiritually right now. Now, why did these men appear talking with Jesus? First of all, a couple, you know, a couple of ideas. One is that Moses was the late, he, he was the great lawgiver. And Elijah was the great, you know, great prophet of the Old Testament, considered to be the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. And Jesus, Jesus came to do what? He came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Second, both Moses and Elijah had unique encounters with God in their last day on earth. Uh, on Moses' last day, God took him up onto Mount Nebo and showed him the land that was promised to Israel. So he could see there. He never got to go in. Uh, but he was able to see where the children of Israel were headed next and experiencing the promise that they'd had for a long time. Uh, then Moses died and God buried him, though his body was never found. Some lesser prophets from Bethel and Jericho warned Elijah that his life was in danger and was about to end. But soon after that, with Elisha, his successor, whom he mentored for a long time as a witness, there were chariots of fire that took Elijah up into heaven to be with God. And he experienced the glory of God in great measure. And then uh, third, according to Luke, they were speaking to Jesus about what? They were speaking to him about his departure, about the end of his life on earth, physical life on earth, and what was coming ahead. They were there to encourage Jesus to be there with him and pre help prepare him for this greatest mission of all, and that was to lay down his life. And he wanted to complete that mission even while he was under great duress. And who better to cheer him on than Moses and Elijah? You know, these two great witnesses of the glory of God. There's about a twinkling of an eye uh, between death and being alive in the presence of God. We're going to experience that. Uh, these two servants of God have been there and done that. You know, wouldn't you like to be have been a part of that conversation, heard what they actually said to Jesus? You know, well, maybe someday we'll get a replay on that uh, and be able to, uh, maybe some kind of heavenly streaming thing can go on and we can go back and, and watch it again and hear what was being said, you know. Uh, these three disciples were invited to be a part of this. How amazing. But they still had not grasped the reality of what was about to happen to Jesus and to them. They were witnessing, though, a bit of heaven on earth. And that's why Jesus wanted them to be there. You know, He'd already talked to them about binding and loosing 
on earth what is bound and loosed in heaven. Well, they're getting a glimpse of what that's about right here. You know, the presence of God in heaven coming in and showing up right there on the top of this mountain. You know, moving into the space that they are occupying. And what a beautiful thing. Eventually, as Jesus had described to them that they also would suffer, and the two of them would be martyred, that would happen to them. Uh, all the disciples, those early disciples, uh, had been martyred except for one, and that was John. And these three, Peter and James, were both martyred. Peter was crucified upside down. James was the first disciple to be put to death by being sawed in half lengthwise. And John was placed in a pot of hot oil, meant to kill him, but he survived and then was exiled to the island of Patmos where he recorded the revelation uh, at the end of the New Testament. And uh, he was the last of the original disciples to, to die. And what a disciple of God's love John was. In fact, in his dying breath, somebody said, well, what do you want to tell us at the, at the end here, John? He said, that he bent over and listened to him, and he just kept repeating, love one another, love one another, love one another. And that was a new commandment that Jesus had given them. Now, in verse 4, we continue to see what happens with Peter. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, you know, you kind of get the impression maybe there's a little confusion going on as, to, as if, you know, Jesus and Moses and Elijah are all kind of equal here. But Jesus was not the equal of these two men. He was the greatest. He was the Son of God. Luke's account tells us that they had been asleep, these disciples, and perhaps nearly missed the whole thing. Perhaps we would sort of go to sleep on the Lord sometimes. I think Michael talked about that too. Uh, you've been reading my notes, Michael. See, I don't know where he is, but you know, uh, they'd gone to sleep. Uh, they'd become groggy, you know, like Michael's mentioned, you know. And and sometimes we miss out on something really great that that Christ wants to to show us or to tell us, and how important it is that we stay close to Jesus. So when he gives us the invitation to experience something special with him, we'll be right there ready to say, yes, Lord, I'm coming with you. And so with a readiness of what he wants to show us and to say to us. Now, Peter, once he experienced uh, some of this very special supernatural experience of, of the glorification there on the top of the mountain, he didn't want to leave right away. I don't know any of us would want to do that. But he thought maybe it would be good to memorialize it and to erect three tabernacles, one for each of them, and, and, uh, and in honor of that occasion. Peter did not see that there was a purpose for this experience, that, that it was really it was something forward-looking, not something to be necessarily always looked back on. But it was to prepare Jesus for his suffering and death and them as well for what they were faced with at their trials. Now, it's kind of in our human nature, isn't it? To want to memorialize our spiritual experience. You know, I was raised in a, in, in a Pentecostal family. Uh, and the great Pentecostal revival of the early part of the 19th, uh, 18th, uh, 20th century uh, took place. It began there in a, on Azusa Street uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, and there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And all my life, as I was growing up, I kept hearing preachers say, we need to return to Azusa Street. You know, We need to experience what happened at Azusa Street. Well, no, God always is doing something new, you know. And we can't memorialize some spiritual experience and kind of rest our laurels on that forever. He wants us to be open to whatever He has for us as time goes on. I've experienced three very wonderful and powerful spiritual experiences uh, in my walk with the Lord in all these years. They're, these are kind of things that I would tend to want to memorialize. The first happened in New Orleans when I was 21 years of age. And I did not have a real understanding of the grace of God. I had more of a performance-based relationship with the Lord. And on that night, I won't tell you the whole story, but on that night, 
uh, as I was reading, actually reading an essay by C.S. Lewis, and all of a sudden, the, the love of God just swept into the apartment where I was living in New Orleans there, uh, and, and just filled the whole place with His presence and God's love, and my heart overflowed with love for God and a joy in the Lord. I did a lot of singing and laughing all night long that night. Uh, and it was joy in the Lord is what it was. And But the, the other thing that happened to me that night, I think it was a, a supernatural baptizing work of the Holy Spirit because I had a boldness to go out and witness like I'd never had before. And I had a love for people. You know, I was kind of scared to go out, out on the streets there in the French Quarter and witness for Jesus. But that was the last, that, that day was the last day I had a fear of that. I spent the rest of the summer, as I was doing an internship there in the church there, I spent the rest of the summer going into the French Quarter there and witnessing on a nightly basis to the people who were there. And saw God do some marvelous things. But it was after that anointing and that outpouring of the Spirit upon me that evening. The second one was in Reedsville, North Carolina. Not long after I began my first pastorate, and in this very special encounter with the presence of God, I was given a specific calling as a pastor uh, to be a shepherd who gathers scattered sheep. And because of that, God has given me a passion for people who are a little bit off the wall, you know, who are on the fringes of traditional Christianity. Uh, and hosted a lot of those kind of people in my home, you know, and reached out to them uh, on and on. Got involved in, in re Christian recovery ministry before it was popular, you know. And, and, you know, just saw God do mighty things. Uh, all the preachers around me were saying, Jerry, won't you be a, you know, when are you going to become a real preacher, you know, and pastor a church somewhere? Uh, working in prisons, you know, all of these things. Because I've was called to be a shepherd who gathers scattered sheep, not to be spending all my try time trying to reach people to go to other churches, you know. The third experience was in Israel in 1989, where I experienced an encounter with the presence of God. I won't tell you about it today, but it was an extremely powerful experience and a very affirming experience in my life. And that experience had a purpose, a special purpose, of preparing me, it's kind of like these disciples on this day, Peter, James, and John. I was about to go through some of the most trying months, in fact, the trying couple of years of my life in ministry. And I didn't know it was coming. But God knew. And He used that experience, that spiritual experience, that mountaintop experience that I had there in Israel to prepare me for those times those difficult times that lay ahead that I didn't even know about. The Lord knows what we need when we need it. He knows what's coming in front of us, you know. And you, you've got things in front of you you don't know about. Hopefully most of them are really good things. But there may be trying times ahead of you. And I want you to know God loves you. And His grace is sufficient for you for whatever you encounter in this world. He is going to be with you. In verse 5, while he, that is Peter, was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Now the voice of God the Father interrupted Peter as he was talking about those tabernacles. Uh, God, in essence, was saying, Be quiet, Peter. <laughs> I've got something I want to say. And uh, so he interrupted Peter out of the bright cloud of glory, and the Father confirmed Jesus as his Son. Now you can see, can't you, how important this was to Peter? What had happened in chapter 16? You know, Jesus said, who, who do you say that I am? And Peter had this divine revelation, not by flesh and blood, but it came from the Father in heaven, where the Father had given him that revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then what happened after that? Jesus, the Son of God, the Christ, tells them what's going to happen when they get to Jerusalem. And Peter says, never going to happen, Lord. You know, and he rebuked Jesus and wouldn't listen to him. Now, wouldn't you think if you just had the revelation that you were hanging out, you know, with God, the Son of God, that you wouldn't be 
rebuking him for something he said? You know. And so Peter, he was rebuking the Lord. And so he kind of lost that, you know, that, uh, that very thing that had been so special just a few moments earlier there. Uh, and uh, so I think one of the things that we have to understand here is that sometimes we do kind of lose our way, don't we? But what Jesus does is He understands uh, that we need something more to get us back on track. I think that's one of the reasons Jesus invited Peter to go along. And when Je- the disciples, verse 6, when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. When they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now, the Father affirmed to Peter, James, and John that Jesus is indeed his beloved Son. He is the Christ, and above everything else, they must keep listening to him. Above all other voices that come along, guys, we need to listen to Jesus. We need to listen to what God is saying into our hearts and minds. Now at this point, as Peter, James, and John witnessed what was going on with Moses and Elijah being there, and now God speaking, God the Father speaking, and all of His, you know, the presence, the powerful presence, and what He was saying, uh, lots of special effects going on, you know, what did they do? Well, they couldn't even say, wow, you know, or, whoa, (laughs) what do you think about that? They couldn't do it, could they? All they could do was, was kind of just bow before the Lord. And, uh, and they were afraid, the Scripture says. You know, I love it that Jesus touched them. I think He was trying to tell them, you know, look, uh, I'm, I'm still with you guys. Moses and Elijah are gone. But I'm still here. You know, I'm still here. And that is enough. Verse 9. Now as they came down from the mountain... Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Now, I can think of two reasons why Jesus would tell these three guys not to tell anyone about this. And one would be that the other disciples were not a part of it. And you can imagine that certainly some jealousy might arise among them. And how do we know this? It's because what's going on down at the foot of the mountain Luke tells us this. What's going on is that they are arguing among themselves over who is the greatest among them. Now that kind of tells you something, doesn't it? So if they get down the mountain and say, well, guess what we saw, guys? And you didn't get to see, you know? But that would just foster more of that argument, I'm afraid. But the other one was that, or is that Jesus had not completed his mission as yet. And going around and telling these things to people around them, what would that do? The the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they would get all ramped up even greater in their opposition to Jesus. And perhaps he would be arrested out of season or out of time uh, from when the plan that God had established was. Jesus wanted to fully complete his mission. So uh, Peter, James, and John didn't go around giving speeches or Uh, having special services to tell about their supernatural experience, but rather they moved on into God's work at the foot of the mountain. And that was God's plan. It was time to come down from the mountain. Verse 10. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. And then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Now Malachi, the last prophet that we read from in the Old Testament, spoke of Elijah preceding the coming of the Messiah as a messenger preparing the way of the Lord. And Jesus reveals here that John the Baptist was one as Elijah. In the likeness of Elijah, he had come preparing the way for him. Now, what does all of this mean to you and to me? 
What does it tell us about our relationship to God? What has God been saying to you? Now you're probably not going to answer that, although maybe a couple of you would. Uh, maybe talk about it after service today. But let's for a moment go back to Peter's confession of faith. What a great moment. What a great moment in his life. And then to hear the affirmation of Jesus that upon that confession of faith, he's going to build his church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. They didn't understand fully what that meant at that time. But what a powerful affirmation in Peter's revelation that he had been given. He told Peter and the other disciples that he was giving them the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Another great affirmation. Wow. And that meant that they would be able to discern what was bound and loosed in heaven as it is upon the earth. Now, not yet long after this, when he contended with Jesus about his prophecy concerning his arrest and his crucifixion and his resurrection, uh, Peter, of course, as we said before, rebuked Jesus and he vacillated between hearing the voice of the Father from heaven and hearing the voice of his own fleshly nature. Can you relate to that? You know, sometimes our voice within us, you know, speaks louder than the Lord's voice sometimes, doesn't it, to us? But something very powerful happened. Jesus asked Peter to go up on the mountain with him. And, he, and Jesus was enveloped in the glory of the Father from heaven, receiving a visit from Elijah and Moses. Peter was there at the invitation of Jesus because Jesus knew he needed something more. He let Peter in on it. And what he showed to Peter, and I hope he's showing this to you and to me as well, is that heaven is not necessarily some faraway place. When He, the Son of God, is with Him, heaven is with Him. Do you see that? The kingdom of heaven is Jesus. And it's wrapped up in Jesus. Wherever Jesus is, there is the kingdom of heaven present with power. And so, instead of continuing to listen to the voice of the flesh, we can now listen when you're in the presence of Jesus. You see that there's a voice that the Father speaks again. That that confession of faith is valid. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And this verified once again to Peter the message he had first heard. Now all of this, as we look back, has the purpose of preparing Jesus. As Moses and Elijah talked to Jesus about his coming departure, is to prepare Jesus for what is ahead. And prepare the disciples as well that they would not be left alone. Jesus, on the, the night of the Lord's Supper, what would He tell them? He said, you're not going to be left alone. I'm going to pray the Father and He'll send you the Spirit of Truth who will be with you and who will be dwell in you. You're not going to be orphans. You're not going to be left alone. I will be with you as the Holy Spirit. And so, what a great thing that is to know for us as well. That when, when Jesus, we can't see Jesus physically, can we? But we know that His presence is in His Spirit with us. And so we can still hear His voice. We can hear from God the Father. And we are not alone. The very presence of heaven is with us. So here's what I want to... I mean, this is what my heart, as I was praying on how to close out this this morning, this is what came to my heart to share with you. That the presence and the glory of heaven is near us when we are encountering difficult times. Through Jesus, heaven becomes accessible to us when we need it the most. To guide us through every crisis that we are faced with. And though we may face overwhelming things in this world, the light of heaven and the affirming voice of the Heavenly Father in heaven is just a moment away. Some of you are going through trials right now. 
Some of you have family issues that you don't know how to handle. You're not sure how you're going to get through it. Some of you are just really against the odds. I mean, things are, are really pushing you against the wall. I want to tell you that heaven is near. Heaven is near for you. And God wants to guide you through that crisis. We may not see Moses and Elijah. But when we believe and we call on the name of Jesus, the door of heaven is unlocked and we receive whatever we need to deal with those difficult times. Do you believe that? You know, Jesus is here for you right now. Those of you who are going through something right now, He is here in our midst right now to minister to you. Even in the Old Testament, we hear from David as he speaks, wrote about this very thing in Psalm 61. We used to sing this psalm and wouldn't mind singing it again sometime. Hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. What's the tabernacle? It's where the presence of the Lord is, you know. And I will trust in the shelter of your wings. Listen, heaven breaks through into our hearts with the measure of faith so that we can have a persevering faith through crisis times through troubling times. So perhaps, again, here this morning, someone is facing a crisis in your own life. Peter, James, and John were facing something they just couldn't wrap their minds around. And then when it happened in Jerusalem, it was even more difficult to wrap their minds around it. But they had seen Jesus glorified. They had been, they had been on that mountaintop. They had seen the visit from Moses and Elijah, you know. They experienced the entrance of heaven into their space and seen the glory of the Lord. And no doubt, as they faced even greater things, persecution and death, that they would, would, would be able to think back. That mountaintop experience is how I remember. And this is what's ahead for us right here. We're going to experience heaven, you know, in, in a greater measure than ever. So, friend... Let me say, say this to you. You do not have to face trouble alone. The Lord of heaven is near. And He is the rock. He is your shelter. And a strong tower from the enemy. And maybe it's time to come apart before you fall apart. And spend time with Him. Jesus invites you to the mountaintop. He wants to refresh your soul with the breath of heaven so that you can go back down the mountain and face the world of crisis and cares and his strength will be yours. Right in the middle of trouble, his peace will sustain you and you can trust in the shelter of his wings.